Good morning. I was just thinking about um, that song. Uh, I think it was in the mid to late 90s, and it might have been Audio Adrenaline, maybe. I can't remember. Because I'm old, I can't remember. Um, but uh, so this group, um, as I put my glasses on, um, had been focusing on, you know, like their music. They were competing in, in contemporary Christian music, and they wanted to excel, and they wanted to, you know, become more popular and make more albums and make more music and make more money so they could keep going further. And um, I mem- remember the story that the... the um, the lead guy, I can't remember his name right now, but he came to a point in, in his life where he was just exhausted and had lost the love of doing this and the focus on why they were doing it. They become so consumed with performing that they'd lost focus of Jesus himself. And so at, at a crossroads, they, they come as, as, as a group to the point where they had to surrender and be reminded of why they were doing it. It's because of you, Jesus, that we're doing this. It's because of you and worshiping you. It's all about you. It's such a beautiful story of like, you start off on this path and then somewhere along the way lose your focus and lose your aim. And these guys had gone off this way, off the path. And God met them there and bring them right back to his path. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's the story of redemption. Um, so we continue today in our study of um, Nehemiah. And we're in chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. But before we get into it, um, I'm glad that Jimmy mentioned what he mentioned today about um, uh, in his prayer on, on Billy Graham 1 and then 2, um, the, the events in Florida last week. I, I had enough in... in my message last week, enough material that I neglected to mention that and just bring our attention to that. The the amount of hurt that um, has happened um, in in the public school systems and um, when we look at prayer and and we look at Nehemiah, um, there are some things, as we talked about in Scripture, that are descriptive they explain the situation, the context, what's going on, uh, the circumstances behind the story, behind the book. And so there are some things that they, they're just descriptive. We don't adopt them into our, into our life, and we don't practice them. There are certain things that are prescriptive that we should take on, like the prayer uh, at the beginning when he focuses like four months of his life to this issue of the wall being down. The zeal that Nehemiah has for God and for his people, the passion that drives them to to do this work, yeah, we should adopt that into our life. But there are some prayers, like the one last week, in in, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads. We don't pray like that anymore. We shouldn't pray like that anymore. This is a particular time in redemptive history where this is before Christ, right? In the Old Testament, we talk about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In one of my favorite movies, The Filler on the Roof, they talk about, well, we're all going to be blind and toothless. And so we look at, at Nehemiah and some of the prayers that, 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 that he has, 
It's, it's kind of like when we look at the, at the New Testament and we see John's and James and, and they're going to different villages, right? And, and the instructions are if you go to a village and they don't welcome you, they don't receive you, they, they, they're not good hosts to you, you, you move on with your message. You move on to the next city and you, you, know, you dust off and you go. They get to a particular city and they're not welcomed. And James and John, um, the, their kind of adoptive, uh, adopted name is the Sons of Thunder. Because they go up to Jesus and they say, Lord, let's bring fire on them. Let's take them out. Jesus says, no, 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 that's not what we do. That is not what we do. Grace. Love, mercy, patience, kindness, all of these things should be a fruit of your life in Christ. So when we come up to some of these um, prayers in Nehemiah, we, we need to be very careful and, and, and look at that through the lens of Christ. Oh, they didn't, they didn't know Jesus. Okay, okay, I, I understand. That's the point that we need to get to, not like, well, I saw it in Nehemiah, so Lord, all those people that are coming against me, take them out. So let's be careful with that. When we think about prayer, it should be concern and mercy and compassion. So when we look at Florida, it should tear us apart. should have an impact. I, I don't want to go political. I'm not going to. But we see it, right? You look around on Facebook. The, the outcry isn't those poor kids. I'm going to hang on to my gun. And I see and understand the value in that. There are rights. And we know the reason that those rights are there. Right? But our cry for our guns should not overwhelm our cry for those babies. Mercy, compassion, cry and grieve over it. Well, it's just another shooting. Yes, it's just another shooting. And we can't be callous to it. Mercy and compassion for those babies and their families. Continue to pray for them. And lastly, before we get into the scripture, um, I remember this is in the, in the matter of prayer too for, um, for the Graham family. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, my dad, with his limited English, listening to Billy Graham. And, uh, and then just how incredible it was at the, end of, um, at the end of his sermon, just the crowds that would be rushing down these stadiums. And he would be international. He would be within the U.S. Everywhere that he went, just the power of the Holy Spirit operating in that room. And he gets lots of criticism, and that's, that's on them. But I saw a man led by the Spirit of God to go to all nations, to make an impact for the kingdom. And it's just, it's something that was impactful for me this week that... Um, we can just jump right in, and I and I'm forgive me for not speaking on it last week, but um, just submitting to the Lord and to His Spirit and where He's guiding this morning. Um, so, in your prayers, diligently pray uh, for for the folks out in Florida. For man, there's a lot of trouble in the world, 
Uh, and so, well, am I going to pray for every situation? Yes, pray for every situation. Yes. Um, and, and just thank God for the work that, um, that Billy Graham and, and his family, Franklin Graham, continues on with that awesome work. Let's pray for them. And they know, they know. You, you listen to any of the interviews, they know where he has gone, right? And, and, and we are glad. Jesus himself, in his presence, that's where he's at. And, and yet, there are ties here in, in this world that um, they, they will grieve and they, were, they will mourn over that. And, and so we grieve with those that grieve and mourn with those that mourn and we celebrate with those that celebrate. Um, so having said that, <clears throat> let's go to Nehemiah chapter 5. And we'll be reading in verses 1 through 13. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and on and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. We're the same. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them, and I said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not? to walk in the fear of our God, to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies. Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchids, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said amen and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, God, thank you. You're such an awesome and powerful God. You are omniscient, Lord. You know everything. You know us intimately, and you know what we need. God, thank you for the work that you are doing within me, within us. Sometimes that work is uncomfortable. 
But we have to do away with our corrupt thoughts, with our corrupt understanding, and lean on your word heavily for both. Guide us this morning. Give us understanding. Your, your word says that we should ask, and so we ask today. Give us understanding, Lord. And then give us the courage to apply these things into our life. That it would not just be head knowledge. Oh, I know the answer to that. But that it would be applied into our life. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the people come to Nehemiah because in the middle of the building of the wall, there is an injustice being done. And it's within. Last week we saw that there were people around them as they were building the wall that didn't want the wall to be built. And so there were, there were taunts and there were threats and there was mocking. Oh, what do these fools think? They're going to build it in a day? Tobiah even joked about it. Man, if a fox gets up on your wall, it's going to knock it down. It's genius, Tobiah. That's awesome. And so the threat was from the outside in. And so the, the effort is, let's get it built up. And they are at the halfway mark. And now that they're at the halfway mark, that's even a bigger threat to them. And so now they are angry. The opposition outside the wall is angry, and they come together to talk about and plot how they're going to go against them to stop the work. But they pick up on this. The people of Israel pick up on this. Nehemiah picks up on this. They put things into practice so that they continue to work and still be on guard. They had a sword by their side. We talked about our sword last week. Getting familiar with our offensive tool. When you look at Ephesians, the armor of God, just about everything in there is defensive. There's a helmet, there's a breastplate, there's a shield, boots, one sword, the Word of God. So the work continues, though, but they are on guard. And they overcome... And now they are focusing on getting this thing done and, and there is an injustice inside of the camp. There arose a great outcry. The injustice was terrible and the people cried out, this is not fair. This isn't right. Look, we are of the same flesh. We are the same people. Our children are the same. And yet they oppress us. For there were those who said, we, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There are also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our houses to get grain because of the famine. There was a need. And those that had, they were fine. Those that didn't were suffering. And they weren't voluntarily just saying, well, hey, I've got a little extra. Let me take care of you. It came to the point where those that were suffering had to cry out. Our flesh is as their flesh. 
Our flesh is as that of our brothers. We are the same. We're the same people. Our children are the same. We have borrowed money for the king's tax. We have to borrow money just to pay the taxes. We are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. It is so bad that we're having to sell our kids. In the, middle, in the middle of, like, and we are trying to reach people for Christ, we're going to see some, some things that aren't right. Out of need and ignorance, they are selling their children. That's the only thing that they can see that makes sense is, man, I, I well, these people are willing to buy them. And they said they'll feed them. You know, they're going to take care of them. They'll have three square a day and, 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 and work, you know, that's, work is exercise. They'll, they'll be okay. They'll be all right. And then it also provides food for those that are remaining. So this seems like a good idea. When we look around those that are in need, we see some practices, some things that they adopt into their life to make ends meet, to do things because of need, but yet that, that doesn't necessarily make it right. Forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. Some are already enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. So there's that, right? It's just kind of corrupt thoughts. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. If we're not attached to the vine, like we do a mess of everything around us. And that's what's going on here. The flip side of that is those that have. They're not suffering. They've got grain. They're doing all right. And there's no compassion. There's no mercy. Hey, let me help you. Instead, well, Bob, look, how old is your daughter? You know, my wife is not doing well. I just need some company. If you let me buy her from you, hey, you're going to be set. You don't have to worry about. How evil is that? Taking advantage of a situation. You know, I need an extra hand. Right? I, you've seen my fields. Huge. Look at that. Let me give you a tour of my property, Bob. Look at all that. And I've only got like 30 people working for me. I could always use an extra hand. Why don't you send me your son over? I'll give him a fair wage. Maybe 20 cents a day. I just have such abundance. So much that the Lord has entrusted in me. Like, I just need a hand. Send your son over. I'll put him to work. What compassion, right? What a great guy. What an awesome guy. Taking care of his neighbor. Nehemiah responds. 
I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. We'll see pictures of Nehemiah throughout. At the end, when, when anger sets in, sets in and his response to things. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Their, um, it, it's not a sin to be angry. It's what you do with the anger. Jesus became angry in the temple and cleaned it out because there was corruption. People were using it to sell their goods within the church. And so he makes a whip and kicks everybody out. The religious people weren't objecting to this because they were making a profit. There's a tax. There's a certain amount that the temple would receive from the selling of the goods. So they weren't going to kick him out. But Jesus knew that this place was supposed to be holy and he chases them out in anger. And yet we look at Jesus and he couldn't have sinned or else the cross isn't worth what we think it's worth. So in chasing them out in anger, it was a righteous anger. So and at this point, Nehemiah is still, still in the groove, still on the path. This is something wrong. He became angry. And then he took counsel with himself. He analyzed the situation. He he prayed over the situation. And, man, this is just not right. And then there's also self-examination. How in my practices, how in my life am I endorsing this? How am I contributing to this corruption? Because that's what it is. It's corrupt. It's unjust. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. So he goes off by himself and he, he ponders this and he sees the injustice. He, he, he takes an inside look and in how he's contributing and then he calls everybody in. And he says, this is what you've been doing wrong. I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. You are collecting interest from your own brothers. You are benefiting from their misery. I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, are, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers. We just, we, we've gotten all of these people that have been in exile and brought them back. And now you are taking advantage of them. They were silent and could not find a word to say. Verse 9, so I said, the thing that you are doing, it's not good. You shouldn't be doing this. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nation so that we can be held up as that shining city upon a hill so that we may make an impact on those around us So that they're not mocking us. And instead, because of the love for each other, that they can come and know the Lord. The one true God. 
This is a disservice to the cause that we're about, to the work of the kingdom. Can you not see that you're wrong? They were silent. Ought you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Eh. Shouldn't you be in the fear of the Lord? And the, and Paul, we talked about this this morning. Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. There is a, a righteous fear. There is a reverent fear where we're not just, you know, it's just another story or, or this head knowledge of this historic Jesus. Yeah, I believe that he lived and that he died. Or we swear allegiance, but... It doesn't shape us. It doesn't do anything in our life. We just continue on. The same pattern of living, the same pattern of thinking. These people were religious. They went to the temple. They did all the right things. They went to church. And yet there was sin in the camp. Moreover, verse 10, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Get rid of the interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchids and orchards and their houses and the percentage of money, grain, wine, oil that you have, exact, have been exacting from them. Give it all back. Give it all back. Repent is what he's saying. Confess and repent. He himself, Nehemiah, confesses to the fact that he had been taking part in this unjust practice. Once again, last, the last two weeks, I've been going back to First John about the confession of sin. He who says, I have no sin, makes him a liar. And, and, and it's written to a church. Our walk, our daily life is one that we are continually confessing. We are forgiven. When we come to salvation, we come to that point where we realize that He is so great, that He is so awesome. And that is the motivation for us swearing allegiance to the kingdom. Not trying to get fire insurance. Okay? Not trying to protect our hide. No. Because we love him. That is the driving force of salvation. Because we realize how awesome he is. Not because I don't want to go to hell. That is a byproduct of loving him. But that should not be the motivation for that prayer. And he takes a look inside and he knows where he has taken part in this corrupt practice. And he repents and he confesses, I have sinned. Return to them everything then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. 
We will do as you say. We'll see later on uh, the, the outcome. We will see how this shapes out. Don't be so quick to say, I will. I'm, I'm going to do this. Don't be so quick to promise, you can count on me. I promise. Because another thing that we are pressed on on a regular basis, and we covered it this morning, is count the cost. Because it's going to count, it's going to cost you everything. Not just a little bit, not just some inconvenience, not just a, a turn away from a certain plan that you have, or, or, or an uh, uh, adapting to, to the plan that you have. No, that means surrendering your plan to his plan. Not my will, Lord, but your will. And that is daily, from one moment to the next, saying, Lord, not my will, but your will. Because there are times where we, honor, we want to react like the sons of thunder and bring fire. But not, not my will. Jesus says, love your enemies. Well, I'd love for you to take them out. We will restore everything. They're going to get everything back. And I call the priest, and Nehemiah takes action. He's, All right, is that what you're saying? All right, let's bring the officials. Bring everybody in here so we can have witnesses. Bring everybody in. Um, Billy's going to give Joe a certain amount, and, and, and Bob is going to give uh, Sam a, a certain amount. And, and, and we've got it in writing, and here are the priests and the officials, and we're making it official. This is the deal. We're writing it down. Not only that, and here's where we get into, okay, we don't, this isn't prescriptive to us. I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house, from his labor who does not keep this promise. If you don't do what you're talking about doing, then I pray that God just shakes you out. Right out of the kingdom. You will have no part in this. Sometimes that feels good to the flesh, right? Lord, just do away with those goofballs. No longer a part of the kingdom. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. There is this sort of ebb and flow of their walk. And, and Israel is a type and shadow of the church and our walk. The, the, the stories are true, but they also reflect who we are. Maybe we, we face something difficult in our life. Financial problems or family problems, having problems with kids or, or in-laws or, or whatever. Marriage. Or sickness. And, and we just, we, we don't have any answers and we don't know what to do. And so finally, we bend the knee. And we go before the Lord and we cry out. But then things get straightened out and we're doing well and we forget and we let our life go off the path again. And we see that 
in the people of Israel. We have to count the cost. I mean, to continue to persevere and be faithful because he is faithful. And if he is faithful and we are being molded into the image of Christ, then we should be growing in our faithfulness. Let's take a look inside. What we are blind to, that the Lord would reveal. The Bible says, ask, and I will give. So let's ask for wisdom. Let's ask for insight into our own life. What we are blind to, we, are, we do have blind spots. We are fine. When we look at ourselves, we are just, I'm good, man. Look at the, look at, you know, the way we try to justify, too. Yeah, I have a couple of slip-ups. And we minimize them. That's, you know, that's just kind of leftover rubble. Let's take a good look inside and ask the Lord, Lord, where I am blind, where I just don't see because of my practices, because it's just the way that it's been. Reveal yourself within me, the corruption within, Lord. Expose it. And cleanse me. I challenge you to pray that with me. That that would become a regular part of your prayer life. Not just the wants and the needs. Not just the things that we desire from him. And sickness and, and troubles. And, and, and a part of our growth is just to lay bare. Naked in front of him. Without defenses. And say, Lord, cleanse me. Cleanse me. Just like babies, they can't clean themselves up. You've got to clean them up. And if you leave them to it, it will make them even more of a mess. Another movie reference in, in the Narnia. I think it might be the second movie, The Chronicles of Narnia. Um, there's siblings that go on this adventure and, uh, and they, they bring along uh, one of their cousins, which is just messed up. I can't remember his name right now. Eustace. And, um, and he's just always getting into trouble. And he gets into a treasure that he shouldn't be touching, he should be messing with. And he turns into a dragon. And he's got these scales all throughout. And he's just suffering and, and crying. And he just wants to become a boy again. And there, there's this point in the movie where he, he is trying to scrape off the scales himself. And he just can't. He can't go deep enough to take off his sin. That's what it represents. Is he's just working on himself and trying to put forth this effort to cleanse himself, but it's useless. He, cannot, he can't do it. And Aslan represents God. The lion comes and with his claws just starts striking at him. And at first sight, you might think, oh, he's attacking him but he's cleansing him. He's tearing off the scales, tearing off the sin. So as we go through this process, it's going to hurt because we get accustomed to those scales. We can't do the work. We have to surrender to him that he would do deep surgery within us, no matter what, even if it hurts. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this morning for your word. God, thank you for the work that you are doing within us, God. And we also submit the work that you would have us do, that you would do through us. We are your hands and feet. 
God, nothing will get done if we don't step forward and get things done. We thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. God, you are so merciful. You're such a loving God, and, and you don't give up on us. Today is another opportunity. You are the God of second chances, and, and the second chances keep going on. We can't understand the math of the second chances that you give us, but you continue to give us opportunities, and your mercies are new every morning, and we thank you for that today. Help us to grow in faithfulness. Help us to grow in our perseverance, God. That we may understand and see you for who you truly are. What a treasure it is to be a part of your kingdom. And then we can take that message to others because it's such a treasure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.